Hi, this is Ken and you're watching Mastering UX. Hi, so in this episode, I wanted to get a little bit into this matter of quantitative and qualitative. Specifically, I wanted to get into how quantitative can really be paired up and go hand in hand with qualitative. When you're working on a project, you may have an arsenal of different kind of research methods that you're using uh, throughout the course of the project. And so I wanted to talk about how these can be strung together so that they complement one another. You know, I think, you know, when you're talking to people, you'll find that people have a favoritism and act as if one tool is superior to another. It's really not the case. Every tool has a specific function. Of course, you can use a screwdriver to possibly hit a nail, but it's not the, be it's not the best tool for it. And so you need to realize that every tool uh, in quantitative and qualitative, they have their purposes, they have distinctions, and they really need to be used appropriately, and they really need to be appreciated for their strengths. You know, I had an experience where I was working on a project and um, somebody showed me a bar chart graph and it showed that there was different modules on one page. And on this one page, the statistics came out to what I call as peanut butter spread. It was kind of 27%, 26 26%, 32%, 19%. Um, so there's nothing that stood out. And so I think at first glance, your assumption when you looked at that bar chart is that everybody has a different preference and that it's really going to be hard to create a home page that's going to satisfy everyone. <clears throat> well, we got into this and we did some qualitative interviews. We talked to different persona types that represented um, the different user groups. And what we discovered is actually they were all the same. The reason why they preferred something and the reason why they did not like something all had to do with the same factor. And that factor is, is that um, if what was on the page did not help them for their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities and what they were going to do today, <clears throat> if it didn't inform them, then they were not interested in that module. So, you know, I realized that when you have this qualitative data that is backing up uh, something that you saw through some statistics, um, you know, you can gain an insight because you understand the why and you can design according to that. Formally, we didn't have a way to really make a design decision, but when we had this new qualitative data, we were able to see that there actually is a common thread. So all the pages that we designed, we tried to make sure that this would be relevant information to the specific user type and that they would get data that was actionable. You know, I'll take another case ex example. You know, sometimes you're doing user research and you're getting really positive feedback. Sometimes you even get the sense that your uh, recipient, the person who's being tested, is being very gracious. Um, they, they, you know, of course, we're all empathetic towards people that we're talking to, especially if we're face to face. And what I realized is that the testing went very well, but when we got back the results and saw how the site performed, actually the results were not that good. And so when you're doing qualitative research, you also have to have this in mind that what people say isn't always the final, um, the final story. Um, it, it ultimately determines down to what are people doing? What is the action that they took? Did they check out? Did they finish the tasks that you were hoping that they would complete on the website? Are there more web page views? So all of these kind of actionable steps are things that really are the bottom line. And it makes sense that the business is very interested in quantitative data. Okay, so for our agenda today, um, I'd like to take a little bit of time and compare some of the methods um, and get some sense of what are the strengths and the weaknesses of each. Um, and then I'd like to provide you with a few examples of what kind of methods fall under the two types of research. The last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to give you a practical example um, that's theoretical, but I kind of built it realistically and even borrowed from some experiences that I have. Um, and I wanted to give you a living example of how the different methodologies, which are both quantitative and qualitative, can be used in a way where they really complement one another and that it builds, um, it builds the insight that you need to make a successful product. So we have two different kinds of research. We have the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, so quantitative is really focused on the what. 
And I, it also is focused on the who and the when, but primarily you're focused in on what happened. With the qualitative, you're really interested in the why. With quantitative, you know, you may have large samples. Right here, I'm listing out 20 plus. But in actuality, you may need to have 1,000 users. You may need to have 10,000 users for that data to be meaningful to you. With qualitative data, it's, it's a lot more about, uh, it, it, you could have about six, and you tend to find that there's diminishing returns after six users, given that you're in you know, sort of a distinct user group and there's not too much diversity between your user types. Um, with quantitative, you're really studying the behavior. What is the action? What did they do? And with qualitative, you're really looking at the attitude. What are they thinking and what are they feeling? Even what are their sentiments? Um, as, you, as you know, um, it's very important to know how a person feels. Someone may do an action, but it may be the last time that they would ever want to do that action again. They may be on the verge of really going to the competitor because they're so frustrated with that experience, but your website is the only website that they feel that they can, they can use. Um, there's also the aspect that quantitative is really looking at numbers, it's metric, and qualitative um, research is really looking at the narrative. You know, I know that sounds very um, wishy-wash, but uh, maybe I should say that sounds a little bit touchy-feely, but it is the truth. Um, qualitative data usually comes in the form of a conversation, and that conversation even needs to be translated and put down um, into insights, which do, uh, do require some interpretation interpretation. Um, the next point is, is that quantitative data is summative and qualitative da data is formative. Um, uh, you know, analogy is, is when you're in school, um, you might have a final exam and that tests all the comprehensive knowledge that a student has gained over the course of a semester. But with uh, qualitative, uh, you, you have a formative uh, touch points. You may talk to your user several times during the projects, even per module, and find out how they're feeling about it as you're making progress in, in the project. And then lastly, quantitative is objective and qualitative is subjective. Um, I know subjective, it may sound negative, but actually subjective, meaning that we, we actually want to be objective about what are the subjective feelings that a user has. Okay, so I want to go through some of the methodologies. Um, so over on the qualitative side, you could have concept testing. And concept testing is where you might show um, you know, you might show a design and probably at this point, you're not putting the design in front of the, you're not allowing the user to click on anything. It's not an interactive prototype. But at this point, you're just trying to find out if it's desirable. Does it match expectations? Does it address any kind of pain points? Um, and then there all, is also a diary study. Um, although this is qualitative, this is really focused on the behavior. And so, and it's very observational. So you can either have people write things down, record things. Um, you can actually, in contextual inquiry, be with the person and try to be somewhat a fly on the wall to observe, but be able to ask a few questions along the way when something really kind of sparks something and you really want to know why they took a certain, did a certain action. Um, the next one is, is usability studies. Um, I think we're very familiar with usability studies. A lot of times you'll put the, the interface in front of the user, allow them to click on things, perform tasks, and you're able to find out if your interface is working or not working, if it's intuitive, if it matches expectations, do they feel positively about it. Um, and then on the quantitative side is you have web analytics. These are very objective. It's just a robot that's collecting these stats. It tells you maybe how many pages are being viewed and what pages are doing better. Um, you know, and now these analytics have gotten very sophisticated to where they can track flows. You can track when people are dropping off. There's web browser statistics. There may be even the country of origin that this user is from. There's a lot of statistics that can be gathered, and those are all very hard, concrete, objective things. Um, 
And then um, the next objective thing is a survey. And a survey can really be objective or subjective. Um, if you're collecting very um, distinct objective metrics, such as demographics and um, uh, uh, facts that don't change a lot, then it becomes very quantitative. And there's not a, you have less, um, less room for error and interpretation. Um, and then there are some surveys, such as a net promoter score. And this begins to capture on a scale of one to five, maybe, um, how they feel, would they pass it on, would they recommend, and these have to do with actually attitudes rather than the behavior, and the user, you know, might be feeling one way on one day and give it a higher score. Um, so again, surveys can kind of fall into both categories. And then something that's very powerful, and I think that's overlooked a lot, is doing a custom report. You know, at most companies, um, you'll have somebody that has something like Power BI or some kind of engine where you're able to kind of pull out, you know, maybe a certain user type. How much are they using a certain module? This can be really important to figure out if you're trying to simplify an interface and maybe over time a legacy product has picked up a lot of baggage. Um, this custom report can allow you to, um, to determine if, if something's even being used. And then you have your uh, tools that are really right down the middle. Uh, there's a first click test and just maybe you ask a simple question or perform a certain task and just find out what would intuitively they first click on. There's heat maps and those are the ones where you got the kind of, you know, it looks like the weather where there's a storm about to happen. Well, you can see kind of um, how much time where people are looking at this. And this looking is something that in a sense it's objective because you could see that there was more time spent on it. And another side it is subjective because that doesn't mean that they're going to buy your product. Um, that doesn't translate into something that's absolute. So it's somewhere in the middle. And then again, I talked a little bit about the net promoter score. If you made uh, it this far in the video, I really want to thank you. Um, I decided to make this a two-part series. And I wanted to let you know that we've really covered a lot of the foundational elements of quantitative versus qualitative or quantitative with qualitative. But um, I really feel that the third part is really going to tie everything together where we're going to take one practical example and show how you can string together a research project so that the two types of research really go hand in hand. And each methodology as you go along in a long engagement of a project um, there's, there's particular points where certain types of research is going to really lend itself well. So if you do have the time, I'd encourage you to go watch uh, part two of this series. Thanks.